I want to thank our sponsor, Planet Ford. Planet Ford has always been a proud supporter of law enforcement in the community, providing customer service and fleet management, sales and service. If you're looking for that personal quality service, contact Planet Ford in spring or online at planetford.com. You're listening to Crime Scene Today. I'm your host, Dan Zintek. Where we cover law enforcement, forensic, and crime scene future and current topics that are in the news. And today, uh, I'm lucky enough to have one of my good friends I worked with for many years and bloodstain expert, uh, Chelly Rossi. Thank you for coming in. A little bit about Chelly is she's been in law enforcement 24 years, 17 years of that. She's been a crime scene investigator and been court qualified as an expert in latent print examination, blood stain pattern analysis, crime scene reconstruction, shooting incident reconstruction. You know, Chelly, the one thing I've noticed in doing this for a while is that most crime scene investigators, when they go into doing crime scene, you have to do everything. You're, you're doing everything on a scene. But most seem to go towards one discipline or the other that they're really passionate about. Uh, for people that know you, it's very obvious that uh, you've gotten into bloodstain uh, and have really embraced that and researched it and presented on it. You teach it for uh, Texas a and Forensic Science Academy. Uh, to CSIs and detectives and things. So I know that you're very passionate about that, but you've also uh, served on many boards that talk about bloodstain and, and crime scene reconstruction in general. Uh, so there's a change that's sort of happening in the forensic community. I know that you've been a part of many of those conversation and things, and that's uh, one of the big things that I wanted to uh, talk to you about here. So there's two organizations that I've heard of, I, I know a little about, and I know you've been involved in. Uh, one is the Texas Forensic Science Commission, and one is OSAC, which is the Organization of Scientific Area Committees. Yes, right? sir. So, so what sort of brought these about? What's where we're at now in forensics versus where we were and things that have sort of changed? So the Organization of Scientific Area Committees, the acronym for that is OSAC. That um, really is not a, I mean, it has a new acronym, but that kind of morphed from SWIGSTAIN, which was a scientific working group that um, all the forensic disciplines were housed under the SWIGS. Um, that shifted when it went under the National Institute of Science and Technology in 2014, I believe, and I think the first meeting was 2015. And so OSAC is kind of the parent group to house all of the scientific area committees that deal with all the forensic sciences. So when we think about that, it's like, um, you know, they have one for forensic wildlife, you know, all the DNA, the fingerprints, toxicology, um, blood stain, footwear and tire track, crime scene investigation. So there's a huge, it's like a big wheel with all of the forensic disciplines. And there is a subcommittee that deals with just blood stain pattern analysis. So now is this just for the United States or is this an international type of committee? So it is just through the United States. It's under the, the US government. Um, we do have special guests that we can bring in from our blood stain analysts from around the world. Um, but mostly it is for best practices and standards for the United States. So then you also, uh, so that's sort of the national, and then there's the Texas Forensic Science Commission. That came up, it sounds like after, wasn't that 2015 or something that was created? So the Texas Forensic Science Commission was, um, first came to be in 2003. Okay. The, um, they, it became legislature in 2005, and where it really kind of came into um, questions about blood stain where they really started looking at bloodstain pattern analysis was um, in 2017. Uh, there was two complaints that were filed in 2016 where they were starting to look at um, the, the trial transcripts. Uh, one was a, a murder in 91, the other was a murder in 1985. And so that's where they really started asking questions about bloodstain pattern analysis, who was testifying to it, what the qualifications were to offer expert testimony in bloodstain, um, and that's where they were starting to kind of make um, some decisions and rules. Now, who's, and make, who's making the decisions? Who sits on this board? I mean, it's, it's not citizens. I mean, correct. It's, so who, 
how do they get to their position and who sits on this board to make these recommendations or decisions? Okay, so there are four employees of the Texas Forensic Science Commission, two attorneys, uh, one technical advisor, and an administrative assistant. Then the rest of the board is made up from practitioners, not necessarily bloodstain practitioners, but forensic science practitioners um, from state universities like Sam Houston, Texas State, uh, their Texas A&M. They also have a defense attorney that sits on the commission and a prosecutor, uh, Jarvis Parsons with the Brazos County District Attorney's Office. He is the elected DA and he also sits on that commission. So you said they received some complaints. So this is if someone had a problem with how a case was handled forensically, is this where they file the complaint through the Texas Forensic Commission? Yes. So they, if, and it can be filed, it can be filed from the accused. It can be filed from a citizen, a family member of the accused. It can be filed by a prosecutor in, you know, in, I mean, it can, anyone can file a complaint and it's a, an avenue for citizens to have a, another look at a case. So are most of the time that this filed is that they feel there's a wrongful conviction or is it that they believe it wasn't handled correctly or that they think someone's overreaching their bounds by things that are stated? What's, what's the general complaint that's been received? So I think that all of that that you mentioned is how some of those complaints come in. Either they want to call into question the practices of the testing laboratory. So when it comes to toxicology or DNA, um, breath test analysis, that kind of stuff, they want to kind of put forward an argument that maybe um, the best practices wasn't followed or the standard operating procedure. It could be that the testimony given wasn't by a person qualified to give that testimony. It could be from, um, it could be a self-disclosure where a laboratory says, hey, we have a non-conformity in one of our standing operating procedure um, aspects, and so they disclose that to the commission. So now you talk about best practices. So as far as the uh, best practices, I know, like we talk about swig stain and we talk about other things like that. Uh, their suggestions, right? I mean, now, does the commission actually have some type of authority, uh, I guess, punitive damage, or is it just a recommendation to a county or that type of thing? So they they don't have any enforcement um, capabilities. So it's not like they can assess a fine or assess, you know, punishment. There right. is another aspect where um, accredited laboratories you have to have a forensic analysis license and they can revoke your license if they find um, if they have a finding against an analyst and so that does give them a little bit of, of enforcement leverage most of the time it is just a you know they they issue a report um, those reports are very lengthy they are you know about a thousand pages and you know, that report is available online. Um, it's available, you know, through their website. And so really the cost is that if anyone is testifying outside of their expertise and the commission issues a report, they're probably not ever going to be called yeah, as an expert again. Yeah. Yep. So now you talked about accreditation, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as far as the accreditation you just went through for blood pattern analysis and such. But uh, is that who accredits? as far as the forensic commission in the state or is that a national type of accreditation how does that work so the um anab is an international accrediting body and they accredit not just forensics um, forensics is actually a really teeny tiny small portion of what they accredit um, they're accrediting things like corporations and companies like the people that um, build bridges and build skyscrapers right they want to make sure that those people are, you know, following all the standards, following practices, all of that right. so that we don't have, you know, bridges collapsing and we don't have buildings that are falling. And, and so forensics is a really small part of, of that national international accrediting body. So how does the Texas forensic science commission then, I guess, decredit someone or take away an accreditation? So they would make the recommendation to the ISO 
accrediting body. Okay, so they make the rec- so they're not actually removing it; they're making a recommendation to do it, and then that body would either remove it or not based on their findings. Right, right? or they would come back in and, and do an inspection and gather their documentation to, you know, I mean, and, and it's not like they would remove the accreditation. It's more like they would find... They if would, there was a problem. Yeah, they would come in and say, here are these nonconformities, and, and so these nonconformities need to be fixed. Okay. So okay, a love that you have, which is blood stain, so we'll sort of back up a sec. So now, you started at the crime lab in what year? 2002. Year? 2002. Okay, so now was that something you initially went towards? I mean, obviously, you take all your basic class. You have blood stain, you have shooting reconstruction, fingerprints, and all that. I mean, is that what made you start going towards that as sort of this primary discipline that you really were passionate about? So I was a South Montgomery County patrol officer, and there was an opening in the lab, and um, I had talked to Lieutenant Frankhauser, Lieutenant Frankhauser at the time, uh, she retired from Montgomery County as a captain. And she said that I had been recommended by my peers to maybe fill that open position from some work that I had done on patrol. I had caught the attention of some of the crime scene investigators. And so when I came into the lab, I, you know, it was, um, there is a long history of exceptional latent print examiners at the Montgomery County Crime Lab. And so I started learning about fingerprints and, and you know, learning the APHIS terminal. And then one of my first classes was a 40-hour introductory bloodstain course. And I went and I was fascinated by it. I um, loved the science behind it. I, I loved the, the challenge. Um, I completed that class. I couldn't wait for my next class next level. it was a an advanced class I think that was in May of 03 and you know I, I tried to research as much as I could and and went to that class and realized wow there's like a lot to learn and um, you know after that that advanced class there was a uh, mastery level class a 50-hour class and I think that was in 2005 that was amazing and and that dealt that kind of brought in the crime scene reconstruction aspect of bloodstain pattern analysis. Um, also, I had had a, a crime scene reconstruction course um, that I had taken, which really complements bloodstain pattern analysis. And, you know, it just seems like the, the more coursework that I have had in bloodstain, the more that I just wanted, you know, more information and more um, education in reference to to the science so now to, to clarify for some of our listeners so most most people as far as uh, blood stain they know dexter right sure okay so that's uh, pretty much and, and brought popularity to the discipline right it did uh however it also uh, besides the fact that uh you don't go around killing people at nighttime and, and whatnot the other part of it is that i don't know personally of any csi that all they do is blood stain they go to the scene they look at the blood and they leave uh, you know, it's you have multiple disciplines. Everybody has to learn all those disciplines. And again, you may focus on one, and you may become an expert that's called to look over someone else's work and reconstruct it based on things that were done at the scene. But I don't personally know of just there's a job for a blood stain expert uh, at a lab that that's all they do to go to a scene and look at. Correct. And and I do have colleagues. Um, one of my colleagues up in Johnson County, Kansas. He is their bloodstain expert, um, but he's also a trace examiner. But if they have a bloodletting scene, then he will go just to look at the bloodstains. Most of the time, you are a crime scene investigator with an expertise in right. bloodstain pattern analysis. And so uh, with that, I know that uh, you've been called uh, to do reconstruction on many cases and things of that nature and, and to look at other work of other CSIs that work with you because that's not their expertise same as when uh, you turn over some of those fingerprints to some of the experts that you talked about that that's where their expertise and stuff now you recently as in like I think last week or the week before just went to the International Association blood pattern blood pattern analyst Uh, so what's happening new I mean that's that's sort of what I've what I've found through the years is you have the courses that you take 
And then after you have all the courses you can possibly get a hold of, then you go to the conferences because that's where the new things are happening. That's where the new findings are coming up and people are doing their tests. So what's, what's new from the conference? What's happening there? You know, there are so many exciting things that are going on. You know, the, there's kind of two, two things happening with, with blood stain, right? There is kind of the bad press that's out there that is, you know, kind of churns. Um, based on bad testimony from back in the day. Um, and that, you know, just anytime there's anyone that's going to testify about blood stain currently, they want to bring up all of this, you know, this. They want to dismiss one, anything that's happened in between then to now. Correct. And, and they they want to say, well, there's, you know, there's bad science out there. And, and then they just trudge up, you know, one particular case and they assess that to, the whole um but there is so much like globally research technology um physics that is going into droplets of blood you know uh, droplet flight path um virtual reality type stuff where we're going to be able to train analysts in a virtual world where you know they're not we're not having to start from scratch every single time and create patterns and create, you know, where we'll be able to create a dynamic scene um, and then be able to go into that in virtual reality. They'll be able to measure stains. They'll be able to take pictures. Um, when I was, I had the opportunity a couple months ago to travel to Marseille, France um, and interact with some folks from the industry, from 3D scanning, virtual reality, along with some PhD professors who teach physics and fluid dynamics and, you know, forensic courses. <clears throat> and I had the opportunity to train to be able to walk into a virtual crime scene to analyze blood stains and blood stain patterns, analyze evidence that was at the scene. I was able to look out the window. I was able to pick things up and evaluate them. Um, I was able to take a camera, take pictures. Those pictures were available to print out. All in a virtual world. All yeah. in a virtual world. But you could print the pictures out in the real world. Right. And so you could look at your crime scene pictures that you took in the virtual world and then look at your photographs in the real world after you come out of the virtual scene. And so, you know, that that is revolutionary. I mean, I, I foresee in the very near future that there will be, you know, we will have either in our laboratory or in our homes, we will have a virtual reality room where one of my counterparts from around the world in the Netherlands, right, can say, hey, you know, can you, can you put on a headset? I have a pattern to show you and I'll be able to go into my virtual reality space, put a headset on and in real time evaluate blood stains or consult with with my counterpart in the Netherlands without ever having to really leave my home. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I don't think we're very far off from it. I mean, you look at virtual reality, The at this point, uh, most focus is on the games, right? Sure. But uh, as we're all aware, you know, the computer games is what uh, really uh, drives the industry as far as to make video cards better, to make computers faster, because they're always challenging it uh, to make it look as real as possible. And to take that technology and then bring it into forensics, bring it into police work, crime scene, all sorts of different training avenues where, again, I mean, in the past, uh, to set up a, a blood stain class uh, took a great deal of effort, uh, obtaining blood, uh, setting up a place that you could uh, set your crime scene up for them to analyze where, and, and to change it uh, required also a great deal of effort. So uh, to do that in virtual reality, to be able to set that up, um, I, I agree with you. I think that it's not that far off. Uh, and just the fact, again, from going from a gaming type of headset, um, it's pretty much the same. Uh, the virtual reality uh, being just what you're looking at and then now the augmented reality of it overlaying on top of what a current room that you're in, I think is sort of the next step in that. But um, So what else uh, from the conference sort of stood out to you? So there was... Um a lot of presentations about, you know, just the kind of updates, right? Like there, um, 
Martin Everdyke in the Netherlands has done some research on recovering latent print evidence on objects that are then saturated with blood. So say you have a, the murder weapon is a knife, okay? The murder weapon is laying in a pool of blood. And he has developed a process of removing the blood um, and not destroying the latent print that's underneath it so that you can remove the blood and then process the knife and recover latent, identifiable latent prints from objects and weapons. And so that, that is incredible. Now, is it physically removing it? Is it using infrared cameras and stuff to take a photo of it? What, how, what do you mean by dismissing or removing the blood? So it is a process. It's a wet process that removes the blood, so physically removes the blood, but does not interact with the oils and um, fats of fingerprints. And so that you're still able to, you know, kind of like if, if there is a burglary of a motor vehicle and it's, you know, like today in Conroe, Texas, it's raining. Right. Um, but then if you, you know, let the car dry or dry the car, you can process the prints. Like the, right. the rain doesn't remove the, the print on the car. And so same kind of concept is that it's a process that removes the blood but doesn't affect the latent print underneath the blood. And so he's gotten good results with, uh, I guess he's worked on regular cases with this, or this has just been sort of so right research now at this point? Yep, it's just a research project that they are working on. They, I think they tested 140 substrates. Um, it's a huge research project that um, they, they have worked on, and, and uh, more is coming on that, right? It's a, he's not finished, so it's a preliminary Preliminary findings. Yep, and, and and they're working on their their research paper, um, and I would imagine that that's probably going to be published here directly. Yeah, and you know, speaking of research, I know that you also are on the operations committee uh, to the Applied Anatomical Research Center at Sam Houston State, which we uh, commonly refer to as the Body Farm, even yes. though the scientists uh, don't like us referring to it as the Body Farm. Uh, but by me saying that, every law enforcement now knows exactly what we're talking about. Sure. Uh, now, uh, also, I know that I've gone out there, you've gone out there, we've done research on reconstruction of our cases, and, uh, you know, we're gracious for their time, efforts, and uh, allowing us uh, to do that. We've gone out there on, on many things. Um, you know, we could probably spend a lot of time on just the cases that, that we've done, uh, but I know that uh, you've gone out there uh, for bloodstain and done research cases, uh, you know, to advance the science. Um, uh, do you want to talk about... Um, the uh, bloodstain, um, I guess, to finally get past uh, shooting into sponges and those things? Sure. Okay, so uh, so typical in a bloodstain class, they're um, shooting into a sponge, a coconut, uh, whatever, anything else that we can come up with. And the argument, uh, every argument I've ever heard from defense up to that point was, yeah, but it's not a person, right? Correct. I mean, so it's it's not realistic. This is not it. We have nothing to say, right? So that was sort of the start of what you had to take on. Yes. So the – and I, I never understood – you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and so I never really understood the magnitude of the question that I was asked um, because everything that we have done, whether it – be, you know, take a baseball bat to a bloody sponge, take a baseball bat to a spatter head, take a baseball bat to, you know, a um, container, you know, holding blood. The pattern that it creates is pretty much the same, right? The stain size is, is the same. The distribution of it is the same. Which all goes Generally. back to the, the general principle of blood stain, which is just liquid physics and that you're having the same type of source for that liquid. Yep. So fluid dynamics and the viscosity of the, the fluid and, and just general physics. Um, and so I had done a reconstruction using a blood-filled coconut to show the dispersion of the blood. And on cross-examination, I was questioned about the similarities between a coconut and a human head. And the defense attorney asked a very legitimate question on, you know, you said that these, they behave the same, but if no one's ever shot a human head and recorded the results, how do we know that to be true? And um, my answer was, 
well, because all of these other things behave some, you know, have the same results. And so therefore one would assume that it would be no different from shooting a human head. But it's not a human head. But it's not a human head. And no one's ever tested that. And so after I finished testifying, I'm like, you know, it really got me thinking that we really need to try and do at least move that ball further down the field so that we can be sure that they behave the same, right? right. Because if, if it hasn't been tested, if it's never been tested, how do you it know? It can always be challenged. For sure, right? right? Like we can assume it's a great degree of probability, but how do we know for sure? And so that started my quest of trying to answer my own my own question. Um, I talked to a lot of people, very, very smart, degreed people, um, and kind of posed a question on, hey, what do you think of this idea if we were able to reinfuse a human head? And so that, in and of itself, was a question on, okay, now how are you going to do right. that? And so lucky for me, I have a sister who's a funeral director. And so I was like, well, if anyone would know how to do it, I, my sister would. So I call her one night standing in my driveway. And that, of course, panics my sister. Because Wonder why you're wanting to infuse a, a body. Right. And yeah. so I can, you know, and then that brings us back to the whole Dexter conversation of, oh, my gosh, she's got some. You have a body somewhere. That, weird yeah, room okay. in her house that's covered in plastic that she's going to be doing some weird Dexter stuff. And, and so I had to assure my sister that. No, you, I was you not, did not currently have a body. I was not so. in possession of a body, and I was not about to start, you know, cutting or doing any, anything like that. Um, and so, you know, she was able to give me some very helpful advice, and um, ultimately she said that if, you know, there was a funeral home, uh, like a family-owned funeral home, that they would probably be the best avenue to assist in, in the process. And so... Um, you know, I am forever thankful to Eichenhorst Funeral Home and Jake Eichenhorst, who facilitated that for me um, and was able to, you know, we kind of had an idea, but we were able to reinfuse um, two cadavers. And so uh, with the donor um, project at the, you know, up at Sam Houston, these donors make the decision whether or not they will allow trauma to their bodies. And so you, if you want just to be part of a decomposition study and you don't want... Yeah, your, there, there's a great involvement as far as when they're, when they're questioned and asked as far as what uh, research they'd like done with their bodies, how they would like to be treated after death, all those things. So yeah, it's at, at no point do we just go randomly do things uh, to, to the bodies. There's a great deal of effort prior to them actually donating their body to science. Absolutely. And I mean, and all of that stuff is explained to them. And, and so there's all these forms that have to be filled out. And so these two particular donors agreed that they, to further, re, you know, further science and further research, that trauma could be um, included, you know, with their, with their remains. And... Um, and so, you know, we had, I had the process, I had my donors and really kind of the ultimate question was going to be, is this really going to work? And, um, a lot of the feedback that I had received from, you know, several people was that they didn't think that that, that that was going to work, that, you know, you were never, um, there's a lot of veins and vessels in our it heads. There wasn't going to be enough saturation or... Well, they, they felt like that that back spatter would most likely come from the veins and vessels at the scalp and that upon death, those veins and vessels would collapse and that you're never going to be able to reinfuse them to where you would get any kind of, any of discernible, it. you know, back spatter stains. Um, but then again, I kind of use like reverse psychology on on what I experienced on the witness stand was, well, if we've never done it, how do we really know? Right. Right. And so that's what kind of kept me going was that I felt like I had come, you know, this far in my, in my research that it now was almost impossible to turn back. And that even if it didn't work, that 
then you've documented that it didn't work. Right. That, that process could still be written up. It could still be published. Someone could look at that and then kind of maybe make some tweaks to figure out how. Because ultimately, that's, you know, that's science, right? That's what we right. want. We want to be able to replicate what we're seeing in in a crime scene. We want, because that's what blood stain is. It's, it's reproducible. Blood stain patterns are reproducible. We can see a pattern. We should be able to replicate it. And so there had to be a a way to make it work. Uh, we just really weren't sure if if our technique was going to be correct. And so, um, you know, I I believe it was like two days before Christmas in 2014, and we went up to the facility. Um, there was only a handful of people there, and it it worked fantastically. And you know, I know that you talked about. Uh, the question someone asked you along the way as part of doing this research would mean at some point you had to realize that uh, you were going to be shooting a body. I realized that on the trip. Uh, I mean, it, it, it became a reality on the trip to Huntsville that morning. So did that change anything other than just the idea behind what the gravity of what was about to happen? So that was a conversation I had with my sister. Um, she knew that I was heading up there, and, and she does really well at, at – you know, checking in and and um, and so she just very bluntly and and you know brought the realism to the project and and she just outright asked me. She said, "Are you going to be able to shoot? You know, are you going to be able to shoot them in the back of the head?" And you know, I said, "You know, sis, I I, I hope so, right? I have been fortunate enough to be um, at." this sheriff's office for 22 years. I had three years previous law enforcement experience and I've never had to fire my gun in the line of duty. And so I didn't have anything to, to draw from. Um, and I said, you know, I really feel like that the, if this works, that this will assist jurors from today moving forward. And so if 12 jurors had to sit in the box and say, okay, but how does she really know? Or how do they really know? Or if no one's ever done this, you know, and so they are struggling with assessing guilt or innocence because this has never been tested, right? Then those jurors then have to struggle with the decision that they made. And so if the, the experiment was successful and bloodstain analysts were going to be able to say, okay, shooting a coconut, shooting a sponge, shooting a reinfused human head all behave in a predictable manner, then that makes the juror's job easy. And that's ultimately was the goal, right? It wasn't to satisfy defense attorneys who are tasked with with defending their client, right? Or for the prosecutor who is tasked with putting on, you know, a good case. It's ultimately up to those jurors who have to make decisions that none of us want to make. Right. And that is taking someone's liberty and freedom. Um, and so I felt like doing the research was going to help them in being okay with the decisions that they have to make. And so I had relayed that to my sister, you know, and, and so she said, you know, call me when it, when it's done and it wasn't until I stepped up onto um, my step stool and actually looked down the sites that I realized, you know, what was about to happen. And all I hoped for was, you know what, you brought me here. You know, um, I, I'm very religious. I, I believe that that I'm in the position I'm in is because, you know, God has put me here. And so, you know, I just said a prayer and, and that if this was if today was a day, if this was supposed to be my research and, you know, that I was supposed to, to write this up, that it would work. And that if it wasn't, you know, if I was just one step in the process for someone else with a really big brain to figure out how to make it work, then I was okay with that also. And so, you know, I just said a, a brief prayer and I did a countdown and I got the most amazing back spatter pattern that, I mean, I was even shocked at the um, the pattern that it created. Okay. So obviously that's that's not where it stopped. So you had 
um, the setup that uh, you had uh, things to capture uh, the back spatter, things that would capture uh, other spatter. So what was your process past that, comparing that to previous things? How did you say this is similar to that? Sure. So I used, um, because I did not want to lose any any potential back spatter to, if I had a through and through shot, um, to forward spatter, right? So I wanted right. any possibility of any kind of back spattering to to come back right to come back towards the target um so i had um my fto my patrol fto i had him reload me ammunition that um controlled the the velocity of the bullet okay. and so i wanted to compare the the back spatter target with what we do in training when we teach an introductory course um, so I used that modified ammunition to shoot a blood-soaked sponge because that's, that's how we right. train um, crime scene investigators and detectives. And then I wanted to then take that data and compare that to shooting a blood-soaked sponge with what I consider duty-grade ammunition. So a jacketed hollow point bullet um, in the same caliber and then look at the three targets and see if I could um, articulate the difference in what we were seeing. And so um, that was kind of the easy part and then kind of the hard part um, in that the doing three targets with droplets that are broke up due to, to the force, right. um, it ended up being about 7,500 little bitty teeny tiny stains that I ultimately had to measure each stain. Each stain right. And the Hornady jacketed hollow point created like close to 4,000 stains just on that target. And so the target size was 30 inches by 30 inches. So it's not huge, right? It's not a... It, no, but uh, it's still 4,000 stains. It's 4,000 teeny tiny stains. And when we talk about teeny tiny, we're talking about the, about the size of an ink pen, the tip and just dotting the paper. Yep, of an ink pen, if not smaller. So all of that, a lot of that was done microscopically um, on an enlarged computer screen and then using a set of calipers to, to measure those stains. Right. So uh, obviously you have published this uh, I have. for people to find. So where, if someone wanted to look at your research and use your research, where would this be located at? So it's published with the American Academy of Forensic Science, um, and it is their... Their publication, it was published um, January of 2018. Um, and it's co-authored by my um, colleague at the Sheriff's Office, my Sergeant, Leslie McCauley, um, as well as Lynn Harold. Um, Dr. Harold retired from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And um, Tom Bevel, who is my mentor in Bloodstain, he retired from um, Oklahoma City PD. And I completed my mentorship in Bloodstain through him. And then I had a student that assisted me, um, Stephanie Waterama. She actually got her master's degree using the same two cadavers. Um, she did a gunshot residue study and was able to get her master's degree also from the donor. So um, these two donors, not only did they help Bloodstain pattern analysts, you know, they also... Um, helped with how gunshot residue reacts over over time. Well, yeah, we've talked about this. I know uh, Sybil was a, a guest before, and the fact that just because uh, the cadavers are used for one particular type of research, uh, that's not it. I mean, Correct. it's. I mean, they continue on with. Uh, now they see a decomposition with a result with a bullet hole that has a, a different place for insects to go that uh, all the way down to, to the bones and whatnot. So it's used for so many different things, not just whatever we have intended. So as far as uh, blood stain in general, I, I know that you also have presented at high schools uh, to the forensic science teachers and taught some of those teachers coming up. So is this a discipline that they cover at the high school level as, as part of this? Are you aware in teaching that? So not only now is it covered at the high school, it's now covered at the junior high. So, um, and now grade school students are learning about forensic science in science class. Um, 
you know. So I know some actually have classes, like it's a forensic science class. I know that, uh, like locally, I just know um, Magnolia and Conroe have it at like a high school level. Uh, I was unfamiliar that they had it junior high and stuff. And you teach uh, some of the teachers. The teachers go through a course at SAM? At SAM, yep, right. in the summer. And it's a continuing education class for them that they can take. Um, I actually also mentor. Um, so UIL has, like through Skills USA and through another high school UIL um, academic competition, right? They have not only crime scene investigation as a competition, but there is also a blood stain pattern analysis competition. And so I mentor a team from Klein Oak High School. Um, last year they won their regional division um, and then went on to state to compete. And so they have um, a couple of the students that have come back this year, uh, they're seniors. And so I have agreed to, to mentor them again this year. And we get together usually on Monday night um, for a couple hours. And they, you know, practice measuring stains. They practice determining a area of convergence and solving for their area of origin. And so their, their regionals and then state competition is um, early in the spring. But that is now a competitive aspect of blood stain pattern analysis, which is really cool. Yeah, that, that wasn't around. Uh, not many, I mean, I can't imagine many years ago that that started. I mean, that's oh, pretty it, recent. it's got to be very recent. I mean, I you know I haven't heard of it until probably about the past maybe five ten years that they even had forensic type teaching or law enforcement type teaching in some of the schools and such. So now going back to some of the basics, I know we covered a lot of things, but you talked about uh, point of convergence and angle of impact and those type of things. So obviously those are the the heart uh, of blood stain is is basically telling what happened uh, just by the stains that are there when either you don't have witnesses or maybe you need to confirm a witness's story. So uh, just walk through some of the basics of what these stains tell us and how we actually use them. Sure. So there are four really four very important um, aspects of blood stains that become important to an analyst, right? The size of the stain. So it's an inverse relationship between force and stain size. So the greater the force, like firearms and high-speed machinery, the smaller the stain that you're gonna have. Whereas the least amount of force, like I cut my finger on, you know, I'm doing dishes, I cut my finger on a kitchen knife, and then I'm trying to get a Band-Aid out of the cabinet and I drip on the floor, right? That stain's gonna be really large. and so the more force you apply, the smaller the stains get. Um, so size is, is the first thing that we're gonna look at. The shape of the stain. So if I cut my finger, I'm trying to walk across my kitchen to get a Band-Aid and it drops on the floor, it's gonna be a really nice circle stain, right? And so anyone that's a parent or, you know, uh, right. anyone that's ever cut their finger and, and seen a drop of blood, right? It, it's, a, it, it's nice and big and round. Um, whereas if, there, you know, I'm walking along a wall and the blood drops, right? It's going to be very elongated. And so it's going to look like either a pear or, you know, like a, like a icicle. Right. Okay. And so we've all seen, not necessarily down in Southern Texas, but you know, most yeah. people are familiar with what an icicle looks like. So it's really long and stretched out. Um, so then we have our size, we have our shape and then how is it, what, what is the distribution? Okay, so is, are all the stains in a line, um, either on the ground or on the wall, or do they radiate? Do they, you know, they surround a, a larger blood stain? And so that distribution of, of droplets is super important because that's going to tell us, you know, maybe what the mechanism is. So if it radiates, you know, is it um, from impact? Is it because we've got blood dripping into more blood or another, another liquid um, substance like, like, you know, a drop or a puddle of water. And then the location, right? So sometimes we have stains on objects or clothing that become important. So if you have someone that says, well, I was standing across the street and I saw this man kicking, you know, or, or beating the victim but yet the witness has small droplets of blood, 
you know, on their pants or on their shirt, that doesn't doesn't put them across the street. Okay. And then we have to use things like, oh, let's, you know, let's check the DNA and make sure that the DNA on the clothes actually belongs to the victim because, you know, just because you have blood stains on your clothes doesn't necessarily mean that you're party to a crime. Maybe not be part of that incident. Yep. I mean, we're in hunting season right now, so it could actually be from the deer or the hog that you killed this morning. So, you know, we also have to be very aware of that. There are substances that look like blood. You know, they're Dr. Pepper and Coca-Cola when they're dried. I've been called to many scenes to test the Coca-Cola factory. Yes. Yep. So you open up a Coke coffee, you know, certain coffees look like in a car on the right um, interior, look like blood stains. And so there are a lot of, of substances that when dry looks like dried blood stains. And so that's another thing that we have to be aware of is, you know, just because it looks like blood doesn't necessarily mean it is. Um, but, you know, all of those things. So tying all that together, and you talked about area convergence. So when you have multiple stains, uh, you actually can start uh, at least getting a, a general area of where uh, that bloodletting occurred. Yes. So if we have a radiating pattern um, that the pattern goes, and when I say radiating, it looks like, you know, something that looks like a V or it looks like it's spreading out. It starts, you know, they're like a... I attribute it to like a traffic cone, right? Or a sports banner or an hourglass. And so um, when you have a radiating pattern, then you can look at those stains and you can see um, by drawing a line through their long axis where they originated from, or at least get an area. Um, We're happy if those stains come back to an area about the size of, you know, a volleyball, um, you know, softball, volleyball, that gives us a really nice area of convergence. Um, you know, sometimes it, it comes back even, you know, to the size of a baseball. But that that information is very helpful to determine. Let's say your was your victim standing up? Uh, were they sitting down? Were they lying on the floor when they're struck? I mean, uh, especially when we get the argument of well, it was self defense, right? They're coming at me, and then you start putting those stains together and well, uh, their head was no more than two feet off the floor when they were struck. Uh, not sure how the self-defense thing's working, right? Sure. And, and that that's one of the, the, one of the great things that, that bloodstain does, right? Is it either it proves stories, right? It proves um, statements. And then it also does a really good job at refuting statements. And so if the detective... You know, it talks to a witness and and they give an account. And then, um, you know, based on after the victim was wounded, right, that's where the blood flow starts. I mean, I can't, on blood stain, you really can't do much with what happened before the bloodletting occurred. Um, There's other things that help with that, right? Like if you have blood stains on the bottom of a a living room, like a, a coffee table, and those blood stains on the bottom of the coffee table show that the table was overturned before the bloodletting began, right? So it helps sequence events. So the disturbance happened first, then the bloodletting occurred. Right. Um, but yes, it, it definitely, you know, it can sequence patterns together. So if you have an impact pattern and you have a drip trail and then you have another event, right, then we can kind of walk through the scene and, and maybe sequence what happened first, what happened second, what happened third. Um, and it, it does a really good job at, at if someone says that they're standing or they're standing at the doorway, um, the blood stains could say otherwise. So now sort of coming back around to what we originally talked about is the, the changing in forensics, the attacks or challenges to the forensic community and things. So uh, we've talked about, you know, liquid physic dynamic that doesn't change at science. We've talked about... Uh, your research and proving that this does behave the same that we've always been doing this. So what are some of the challenges that we're currently facing or having to document, overcome, uh, besides just referring to old material that really is not existent anymore? Well, and, you know, referring to old material is like the... Is that the biggest challenge right now? The... The biggest challenge is that 
we have cases where we have recognized that the people giving the testimony weren't qualified to do so. The horrifying truth is that is still occurring today. You know, there are still um, people that are getting on the stand and giving opinions and conclusions and... That they're not qualified to make. That they're not qualified to make and that the... And have, a, and have an effect in the outcome of the trial absolutely ba- based, on, based on their message. And, and that that is not being, that, that, you know, whether it be the state attorneys or the defense attorneys or the judge, there's just no way to, you know, it, it sounds legitimate, right? It, yeah, as a lay person listening to it, you know. Right, it's like, oh, wow, that, okay, that, that's great. And they don't have the training to be able to offer that kind of testimony. They don't, that testimony refutes the actual physical evidence. And so that is probably one of the biggest obstacles that we have is educating the state, educating the defense, educating the, the trial judge on, hey, this is the, you know, this is what someone needs in order to offer this kind of testimony. I mean, if you think about it, if you testify and you say, oh, well, that's an impact pattern, okay? I mean, you're, you're just defining it. Well, ultimately, you're, you are testifying to a mechanism. Right. And so that is, you're offering expert testimony, um, and maybe you've only had like a eight-hour workshop, or maybe you've had a three-day, you sat in a three-day seminar, right? It, it's how do you defend that if you're challenged to say, why is that not a drip pattern? Why is that not, you know, some other kind of, of mechanism and that right there is is kind of where currently we're trying to find that line is where do you go from crime scene investigation and just documenting you know the evidence to where you're actually testifying as an expert because you're giving expert opinions do you Um, believe that basically educating the prosecution defense and the judges would really i say solve but actually help in that that issue I do I in the Texas Forensic Science Commission that is something that they are um, looking at in developing a bench book where everybody has access and everyone knows what the rules of the game are right so if you're gonna get on the stand and you're gonna give expert testimony say bloodstain testimony then these are the credentials that you should have and these are the the checks mark check marks that, that you know you should have next to your name in order to offer that kind of opinion. And if you don't, then you're not going to testify to it. And so that is something progressive that I, I look forward to. And that goes for all the disciplines so that everybody's on the same page. Everyone knows what to expect. The judge knows, you know, if, if you're going to proffer a witness that if they don't meet these qualifications, they're not going to offer testimony. Well, I appreciate all the insight today, everything that you've offered, and certainly we got tons more to talk about that we can come back and everything. Uh, I wanted to give a, a shout-out that uh, we don't normally, but I want to thank for a moment our producer, Dick. He's here every week, uh, make sure everything's working right. Appreciate all his hard work and effort, uh, and also just uh, producing the show behind the scenes at uh, Lone Star Community Radio in Conroe. Uh, he gets to listen to the details of all the violent crimes, depo- decomposing bodies, study of insects as it relates. We totally disregard any plans he possibly has for lunch afterwards. Uh, but uh, again, thank you, Dick. Uh, and next week's show, we have Dr. Simon Lawrence, who has a degree in psychology. He spent the past decade interviewing sexual deviant serial killers. Uh, he's going to talk about those experiences, give his opinion after years of research why sexual deviant killers commit their crimes. So thank you for joining us. If you have any questions or any topics you'd like to see, you can reach me at dan at crimescenoday.com. Thank you for tuning in. We look forward to meeting you next week. Thank you.